Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. Here in studio is our wonderful Mayor of RPV, Jerry Dehovic. Thank you for being here. Thank you again, Liz, for having me, especially oh. at this late evening hour. I know, <laughs> we're good. We, 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 we're happy you're here. You give our residents, the community, a great update on all the things you're doing at the council level, what's happening in the city. So just let's just start off with like a basic overview of sort of the big things happening right now with the council and in the city. Sure. Well, I think, uh, you know, the themes are going to be uh, redundant. We keep talking about what's going on. A lot of things don't change. One big thing coming up, I mentioned last time, is this budget season right now. And, uh, uh, there are several steps that, that the council works through to get to a budget that has to be approved uh, by June 30th of this year. Uh, we have the city manager recruitment is well underway. Uh, union negotiations are about to start in the month of April, so there have been several closed door sessions, uh, closed sessions with council and in, in talking with our attorney and, and how that's going to move forward. And we hope that moves forward uh, very quickly and, and uh, positively. And, um, not to segue, but we're going to look for a significant amount of community involvement in that particular project also. Uh, Marymount, we talked about before, two issues there. Um, first is the uh, new parking lot they have there in the six-month review. That's coming up uh, in the next uh, two meetings or so. Uh, we have the athletic field, which was put off until July. Uh, and as you know, I'm working with uh, Dr. Brophy and the uh, school board president, Aaron Lamont, on another alternative that... Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, we're meeting uh, this weekend, which I think would be the 30th of March. So that's something that, that I'm very much looking forward to and I'm excited about. Uh, infrastructure issues, again, we had the infrastructure management plan, all the steps associated with that are moving forward. Uh, big topic. Zone 2 amendments, that's coming up, uh, I believe, on May 6th, the May 6th meeting. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, citizen input and, and interest in that particular topic. Um, we actually extended the, the review period for the uh, environmental impact report at the request of several uh, residents and we felt that totally appropriate. Uh, and finally, we're, we're, we haven't gotten to the matrix report yet, but we're going to and one of the big things that comes out of matrix is um, the bidding out of two of our larger contracts, the first being the IT services and the okay. other being legal services. So that should come up on the next meeting. So. Again, recurring themes, but uh, right. stuff that we need you know, to deal with. A lot with. of important issues. Sure. Crime and safety always paramount here in the community and, and as you're charged working with the Sheriff's Department. We'd love you to update <coughs> us on just happening on the crime front. Of course, in the recent headlines was that there was another Pongo boat that um, came ashore at Abalone Cove, and that's mm -hmm. always unsettling when we hear about that. Absolutely. And, and this particular incident was, was unsettling um, for the fact a couple different points. This happened on March 15th. Uh, we had some very um, uh, keen and astute residents actually contact the Sheriff's Department that actually saw the Ponga boat out in the water. Uh, but by the time the various departments, we had the Sheriff's Department, uh, LA uh, Police, Harbor Division, Long Beach Police, and the Coast Guard all responded. <clears throat> it was a multi-jurisdictional effort. Uh, but by the time they got there, the report, I think, said that they detained two people. They did, in fact, detain two people, but those were observers. They were not... Uh, anyone off the boat, so there were no arrests, unfortunately. Um, point being is it looked like it was a, a human trafficking endeavor. Uh, there was, was water, life vests, and enough gas to continue, so I'm not sure if Abalone Cove was the, uh, um, the spot of choice to, to offload, but they also did testing of the boat for drugs. There was no residue. There was nothing that indicated it was a drug run, but the fact that it wasn't drugs is, is good, but the fact that somebody would land here with illegals uh, <clears throat> is, is problematic to me too because you don't know their background, of course, and, right. and they were either picked up very quickly or, or scattered and infiltrated. But these are very dangerous landings, and I, I want to mention uh, you know, Coast Guard Chief Petty Officer Terrell Horn, Terrell Horn uh, you know, two years ago was killed when, when his boat was rammed by a, a Ponga boat. So very, very dangerous, very, very serious. Um, there were helicopters dispatched, and uh, the, the response was good, but this looked like a, a very well-coordinated operation. So Right. Well, I know it was a series where we were hearing about it. More often, it's kind of quiet on that because, you know, you, where everybody... But the residents need to really be aware 
and, and pay attention, as you say. And so is this still under investigation? It's still under investigation. That Those are the facts. That's as of today uh, from Captain Bolin. And um, that's the latest and greatest. I'm not sure if it's going to go anywhere in the future, but mm -hmm. they're still investigating. And, uh, you know, they do a good job of patrolling, but sometimes, you know, these things get through. And it's not only here. It was Redondo Beach, Palos Verdes Estates. And, you know, we did have several in RPV. But, right. uh, you know, if anybody sees anything, I would please don't hesitate to call the sheriff uh, as soon as you see something that looks funny. Right, because you think that on Abalone Cove, they might make it in, but you got to get up to the top and have a bunch of people. I mean, it's not. I'm going to share a funny story with you, and I know I'm segueing here, but the uh, several years ago, uh, I saw what looked like, several boats and I didn't think ponga boats at the time never even heard of a ponga boat but I thought it was something very very strange I called the coast guard I called the sheriff and they investigated it and in about a half hour called me back and told me that these were the boats filming Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> out in the water and I was very very concerned because they were high-speed boats and there was a lot going on at that right. time internationally so anyway that, yeah. don't don't be scared to call is my point absolutely well <laughs> Thank you for that. And, and more on the, on the, in terms of the sheriff's reports coming out right now. How are we doing with our crime stats? The crime stats are looking uh, consistent. We still have a few issues with burglaries. And again, the, the auto thefts and the, the petty larcenies are, are a big issue. Uh, I would encourage everybody, the administrative report comes out every Wednesday. And, and in this document, there is a crime report. And it's at the end. And you can get explicit statistics on what's going on in RPV in our neighboring cities. Um, but, you know, my review, and I didn't do a real technical analysis, we look pretty regular, you know, we're in a very low crime city. Um, uh, our sheriff's department does a great job, and, and really it boils down to people protecting themselves, locking their, their doors and windows, uh, and, and really not leaving valuables in the car in the open. Mm -hmm. And, of course, when you mentioned that report, that's by just going on the city's website. You can navigate to find that. city's website is called the Administrative Report. It comes out right. every Wednesday, and it's a whole host of topics on what's going on in the city. All right. Great way to keep up to speed. Um, let's take a look at what's <coughs> going on at the last couple council meetings for okay. the month of March. You had a lot going on, just beginning with the city's biggest infrastructure project. Everyone's watching uh, San Ramon uh, almost complete, and financing was a topic of conversation on that one. Um, why don't you let us know what's going on there? Sure. Well, the, um, as you know, San Ramon was approved last year. Uh, we've got a 50% uh, match from the state. Uh, largest infrastructure project in the city's history, anywhere between 17 and a half and looks like 17 and a half, 19 million dollars. Uh, the city has already allocated its portion <clears throat> from a budget uh, appropriation. Um, we, in August of 2012, approved what they call a reimbursement resolution. We weren't ready to decide whether or not we were going to finance uh, a portion or all of the San Ramon project because, you know, we could, it could have been up to a $10 million bill, basically, if, mm -hmm. it, if it, with overages, it went to $20 million, but it doesn't look like we're going to get there. We're on budget uh, and on time, so that's really, really good. Um, but we did reserve the right to go back and look and see if we were going to finance, again, either all or a portion of the project. And we asked the Finance Advisory Committee, along with the uh, city's financial advisor, to review this and give the council guidance on what they thought. And collectively, just to kind of cut to the chase, um, with the infrastructure management plan in the, in the not-too-distant future, both the FAC and the financial advisor thought that since this was a, a significantly data-driven decision that we didn't have enough information to decide whether it was prudent to finance any portion of San Ramon. And also, too, you know, to be quite candid with you, Liz, you know, the city is uh, uh, doing very well with its reserves. You know, we're projected at the end of this fiscal year, June 30th, to have about anywhere between 9 and $10 million in the uh, uh, general reserves and about seven million dollars in the CIP uh, reserves which is where the money for our portion of the San Ramon project came from. Um, so you know the, the fact said we've already funded this major project that's what the CIP reserves are for. Uh, we do have a whole list of things on the CIP infrastructure wish list and things that need to get done but we need to make uh, um, educated and informed decisions based on data. So at this point in time, and the council agreed with our two uh, best advisors, if you will, um, that 
financing was not appropriate at this point in time. Okay. And you get feedback from the community residents, all pretty much happy and support what you're saying there in mm -hmm. terms of don't incur debt for that project right now. Yeah, and I'm, I, I, they, they were very, that was a very positive reaction. And, you know, anytime you talk about taking the city into debt, I'm very, very sensitive to uh, public input on that. And there was talk about having a debt policy and mm -hmm. what would be involved in a council, either this council or a future council, making those decisions. Uh, and I think that's a great idea under what circumstances and how you do it right. and who gets the, the input and whether it should go to a you know, vote of the voters and things like that. So are you looking to create a framework for that? We in are. Future? And in the not too distant future, we will be coming up. And I think I, I heard we didn't make a motion on it, but the council right. was very much in favor of setting a policy as a guideline into the future. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of that subject, we've kind of covered it. I also mm -hmm. noticed this would be the week of... Um, we're in March 25th, 6th, that there's going to be a lot of, uh, there'll be delays on PV Drive. I the switchbacks. The switchbacks because of the Sam Rome project bringing a lot of materials. Did that's you, right. They said let in the, the residents know. In the morning and the afternoon, they're going to be very large deliveries. They think the, the uh, there are going to be some short delays, you know, five to 10 yeah. minute delays. And, and that's reasonable. And right. they're going to try and do it in off peak hours. But uh, that's coming up, I think they said, for the next week or so. Yeah, so so from, just, from from the 24th till about the end of the month. The viewers, just, just our residents will be aware, be patient. Absolutely. It's all worth it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's move on. Uh, another big hot topic was uh, talking about uh, staffing levels mm -hmm. here in the city and and also including the IT manager position being approved and all that. Talk about what was discussed regarding staffing needs and what you're doing in the city. Right, the, uh, the staff brought back uh, several, actually six positions uh, for council consideration and we deliberated on each of those positions individually. Several of them are positions that during the downturn, the, the great recession as it were, um, positions were eliminated. For example, a permit tech was eliminated, a planning tech was eliminated. Um, volume has picked back up now, so the, the thought process was based on the metrics that were given to us that it was appropriate that those be refilled with the understanding that, that we may make adjustments as we go forward depending on workflow, and that's the flexibility that, that we have as a, as a council. Uh, there was a bit of a concern with the union negotiations, whether we were restricted in any way, but we are not, so that, that's good news there. The IT manager uh, was a position, we did have an IT project manager back in 09, I think was the last time we had that, and Dennis McLean had stepped up and took over basically the IT management position right. for the last several years. Um, and, and he did a good job in that area. We, we, he obviously uh, is the finance director and also was managing IT, and those are really two full-time positions. Right. What we did was um, uh, reallocate and reassign the position to an IT manager and put that, it's not a department head position, but we put that under the city manager's department. So that individual will be reporting specifically to the city manager. And not to the finance director. Not to the finance director. Dennis is going to concentrate on finance. Uh, good news is, as of today, I heard that we made an offer to our top candidate and uh, they have, they have accepted and there's procedures you have to go through, you know, background right. checks and testing and all that good stuff. Right. But so that's a very, very important position. Uh, if anybody's interested in what all is involved with the IT manager, go to the staff report that's also on our website and it gets into explicit detail. I won't enumerate that here. Um, but a very, very important position going forward. Uh, what and you the approved a salary range for that position as well. We modified the salary range because there was it was clear based on the recruiting efforts that people in this field and in this specialty and with these requirements have a little bit different, uh, you know, people are incurring higher salaries at this point. So that we, hit, we had an old salary range. Uh, there was a suggestion by staff. We actually modified that a little mm -hmm. bit and brought it back down. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, this person is, is uh, below the mid-level of that range. And, and I think if we can get him for what I'm told he's going to be hired for, I think it's All a right. good hire. And, 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 and I don't know if you can answer this now, but when this IT manager is brought on board for you, I mean, being able to, you know, in charge of communications, sort of the lifeline mm -hmm. from our city hall to the community as well, like what do you see as like the most important things this person will be doing as the IT manager? Is there something like that you think is really Yeah, well, there are several priority? things. The, the, the city has embarked on a major upgrade in bringing us up to cutting edge technology mm -hmm. with a... a uh, uh, virtual server and, and all the newest software and, and there are several specific types of programs um, that the city is implementing from accounting and public works and 
uh, rec and parks as far as tracking, the ability to do stuff online, and is bringing us into a very technologically advanced area. And so all that, along with just the day-to-day -day maintenance of the hardware, um, there are major software implementations that, that need to take place, and the coordination amongst that um, is going to take a lot of time and, and expertise. And it keeps changing. <laughs> it does change. It changes very quickly. So, you know, I think that I've, I've got a, enough IT knowledge to be right. scary, and I think we're, uh, we're, uh, um, we're on the right path as far as IT goes. And Good. I just want, you know, we, we want to take a look at... Uh, Again, we're going to go out to bid for total IT services, but that's another topic right. right now. We need somebody to focus on IT and spearhead that and also free up uh, you know, Director McLean to focus on finance. All right. As we continue to talk about staffing, do you want to bring us up to speed on what's happening with union negotiations? Or I do. I do want to mention one or two other positions that were in there also. Okay. We, there, there were uh, uh, Public, Work, Public Works Director Michael Throne. Uh, adjusted the org chart and, and the structure in the Public Works Department. We have Nicole Jules is now Deputy Director. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to her. And we also created the position of a Principal uh, Engineer. Um, and, you know, Michael has uh, an extensive history in this area and this has worked in several of his other engagements. Um, and and the, the Council embraced the new strategy and, was, and thought it was uh, a good recommendation. So we have that. And the other one that, that I, we didn't talk about is the uh, a maintenance worker. You know, okay. we've we've had the same amount and of people. Maintenance worker one. Maintenance right? <laughs> worker one. This is the person that's going to go out there and do all these things in the city that need to be done, from painting to plumbing repairs to setting up meetings. Uh, you know, we've had the same number of people over the course of the years, and and the 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 city has gotten more complex by the number of parks, the amount of acreage that we have in the preserve, and just day-to-day -day maintenance infrastructure is aging, including at City Hall. So I think that that was a, a, an also a good hire. So. Right. And so uh, then you had so you said the permit technician, planning technician, Rec and Parks administrative assistant principal. That was the only one. Rec and Parks admin. That's, that's a position that was previously filled. Uh, we waited for the director, Corey, to be hired. And uh, um, there, are, there are several things that, that have been accomplished by temporaries, uh, temporary mm -hmm. employees that, you know, we have a great group of temporary employees, by the way, but this, this position needs some continuity and council felt that it was appropriate to, to bring this in position back and refill it. All right. So, so um, but back on with union negotiations, anything you want to reference? Union negotiations, there? again, we, we had a couple of closed sessions. Um, we are preparing for uh, several meetings that, that uh, our management side council will be representing the city uh, that there are two three meetings scheduled in april so we were trying to give direction and we we got uh, um, a lot of information given to us last week in a closed session for us to go over and and give opinions to our council so he can move forward with those negotiations but i think mm -hmm. that's about a I should say right now. And so. of course, the big position for the drum rolls is <clears throat> our city manager. And you, like you mentioned at the beginning of the show, you're moving forward there. We are moving forward there. And uh, again, I love saying this, the city manager, recruitment firm, selection, ad hoc, subcommittee. <laughs> Don't um, say it three times fast. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's uh, Councilwoman Brooks and Councilman Campbell. And they've met several times and actually have... Uh, glean the list of potential firms to assist us with the city manager recruitment down to four. We're going to have two meetings in the next 10 days, I think the 31st and the 2nd of April, where we're going to interview two firms on each evening. Um, and then we're going to make a selection as to what firm is going to help us go forward. And part of that is uh, reaching out to the community and, and deciding explicitly what we're looking for in a candidate. And have them vet the candidates and bring them back to us for consideration. It's going to be interesting to see how many candidates you get. I think how many uh, qualified candidates. I think we're going to get a lot. And I from think where they're going to come from. It's going to yeah. be exciting. Are you throwing your hat in? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to work on managing the studio. There you so go. So we can keep talking and doing this. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, grant projects <coughs> money being phased out. Explain what's going on. If residents aren't up to speed, that came up at the one of the March meetings. Yeah, it did. And and actually the decision was made a year ago during the uh, um, budget review cycle. They, the uh, budget topic came up in March of last year and it was uh, grants that the city gives to various uh, philanthropies and, and different organizations. And the decision last year was to phase the project out, phase the program out, right. if you will. Um, Do you know the number that around what we? Yeah, would we up? had we had. I think there were eight or nine different uh, organizations that the city gave money mm -hmm. to, 
and uh, two of them were the docents mm -hmm. and the other were the seniors and we did carve those two out because most cities uh, especially the docent and the, and the uh, support for the seniors those are really under separate areas of most cities and we put that under rec and parks which a lot of cities okay. do so those are going to be carved out and those are going to continue to be funded through that budget uh, but there are several South Bay charities that the city uh, has given quite a bit of money over the years to that we put them on notice last year that we're going to fund them for two years so they can plan accordingly. So that's um, through 2014, right? That's through the 14-15 cycle. So they got one more okay. year of a grant, and then at that point, it'll be up to another council. You know, the decisions made by this council that the program is going right. to cease. Uh, Anything can change and anything can be brought back up again. And uh, But at this point in time, that is the and plan. And it was really not so much, obviously we know this, we are a generous city. It's just a matter of like, how do you pick and choose? And is it, it is public funds and that gets questioned about how. You've, it, you've hit them right on the head. I think that, you know, there are so many worthy organizations out there. You know, we'd love to fund them all, uh, but obviously that's not possible, number one. And number two, you, you have the issue that this is public funds and who are we to determine who's better than the other. Right. Um, and there might be, you know, there have been suggestions and there's all kinds of good thoughts so that maybe it's a nominal donation on the part of the city because those organizations use that endorsement to get other funds if they have you know the quote unquote stamp of approval of the city of RPV mm -hmm. or we felt they're worthy enough to even give them something that that helps them in their money raising efforts. So who knows right. where we go with that. It was more about the principle not so much the the, about the dollar at the, and really it comes down to Well it comes down too. to the dollars too you know significant dollars in, in the past that right. were, were given away. So. All right. And uh, a coastal specific plan that mm. talk, explain that to the residents, what that is, if they've never heard of it. And it came up um, uh, the last couple meetings. It did. Well, the coastal specific plan is, is a document that was created by the city in 1978 in response to the California Coastal Act of 1976, which required coastal cities to have a plan. Ours is called the coastal specific plan. And it deals with coastal districts. Um, in our particular case, ours is defined and, and has been accepted by the Coastal Commission as the seaward side of all RPV property from Palos Verdes Drive West seaward and Palos Verdes Drive South seaward. That is our coastal district. And the coastal specific plan talks about uh, preserving views and, and gives us guidance as far as development and usage of the land in the coastal district. So what we had was a um, an applicant who wanted to build a home uh, um, on PV Drive West uh, that went through a very long process of, of uh, trying to get their plans approved and it met with with a significant amount of, of um, uh, resident input and objection and the, the whole issue here uh, in my mind was one of fairness. The, the coastal specific plan, the way it's written, is, is fairly ambiguous and, and there's a lot of subjectivity as to interpretation. It's been around for, you know, what I say 70, that's 22, that's 36 years. It gives guidance on, for example, the biggest primary issue is what they call a viewing station. Where is it that you're going to uh, uh, define what view it is you're going to protect? And mm -hmm. there's a lot of subjectivity to that and there's been different interpretations of the same thing over the course of the years. Uh, some would argue that those are erroneous interpretations, but we'll, we'll leave that for another day. I think I heard day. something about like if you're like the site level, if you're driving in a car in PV drive, like that would be considered sort of the that, view that's expected to be protected. Is that, that right? That's a good one. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there are very few, and I, I think that's probably the most basic one, but there, I think Councilman Knight brought up the fact that there may be certain trails that actually would need to be protected versus the driving view on PV drive west or south, but that's primarily right. it. And the discussion is we need to define the viewing station. And there's a fog line, which is basically, if you want to think about it, the bike lane, the white line on the bike lane on PV Drive West or South, three feet above that, which would probably be the average sitting height of somebody in a car. And, and give that parameter and, and tell applicants that this is the benchmark, this is where we're going to start from. Instead of backing into it or saying, well, it's going to be seven feet or you know, the average person is five foot four to five foot eleven. There's a lot of nuance that has gone into past decisions. We want to give explicit direction so an applicant doesn't get caught up in, in the same type of thing we had in this particular case. All right. So when it comes to the coastal specific plan and that you addressed it at the council meeting, do you really feel you were addressing the residents that were questioning how the city actually adheres to the coastal specific plan? Are you, do you feel like you're moving it forward for those that are concerned? 
Well, first of all, I do very much appreciate the the residents' concerns because one of the, you know this is the general plan talks about preserving our views uh, very clearly, and that's that's one of our treasures here in RPV is our coastal views, um, and uh, we're working on addressing it. We're not quite there yet. We we had a presentation from staff, and they they talked about the history of the coastal specific plan, and we as a council were able to bring forward our concerns. Um, the, the staff is going to come back with probably the most uh, contentious uh, point, which is again, what is the viewing station and where are you going to measure all these different things that are prescribed in the coastal specific plan from? And uh, it's a very, very um, touchy, touchy subject again, because there was subjectivity and different interpretations over the course of time and we want to uh, take out that ambiguity. Okay, well we'll stay tuned for that right. and uh, keep us posted. Uh, at the, um, I think it was the last meeting, we had a wonderful volunteer in the community, uh, Elizabeth Sala. She's now working as a volunteer with the uh, Vector Control. Vector Control, so right. So explain what, what she was talking about in terms of we all got to be, be uh, aware of what's going on with... Um, LA County Vector I was say Control. Bugs, not bugs. No, you're right. Yeah, it's yeah. bugs and pests yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and insects and infestations. I didn't want to bug you about it, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say that. That's right. Um, well, Elizabeth is, is a, uh, she's part of our uh, water quality and flood control right. uh, oversight board and, and uh, she's a fine public servant. She actually stepped up to uh, be our representative on the LA Vector Control Board. Uh, they meet uh, once every two months and she's been to two meetings so she's going to brief us quarterly and she briefed the council at the last meeting for the first time. Uh, and came forward with several suggestions. For example, on our website we really didn't have a link to um, the, the vector control and what they do and how a, a homeowner can find out how they can receive help. I have a perfect example. I had a house across the street from me that due to the Great Recession again was, was empty for three years and they had a pond and a pool and there was a mosquito infestation issue. We called vector control and believe it or not they came out and put mosquito eating fish in there and drained it and did a whole host of things. So anyway, uh, she made several suggestions on what the city can do to inform people and help residents and it's actually on our website as of today there's a section Excellent. there's a section that the the uh, the uh, residents can go to for guidance on how to get to vector control and what vector control does and how they do that and the stats so it's terrific right. she's done a great job thank you elizabeth i know that, that that west nile virus is everyone's worry and we heard about that a lot and everyone needs to be aware about having stagnant water on your property and that's really important because i think there were some cases pretty close to the Peninsula. There were, and again, I mentioned it. There was a uh, an RPV residence father-in-law that I know very uh, closely that actually contracted That's West right. Nile, and uh, it's horrific. It is. It is. Uh, if you haven't, you know, people die from that, and he is. He's had. He's been. You know, seven, eight months, and there's a long road to recovery. And he's a local guy. You know, mm -hmm. and it's. Uh, so it's it's real and it's serious. You got to get rid of the stagnant water. Get rid of, you know, even things like. Potted plants, the bowls on the bottom of pond, that water sits in there. You're going to get mosquitoes in very short order. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, that they need to people need to educate themselves and protect themselves. Okay, well, thank you for that update. Yeah. And go to the city website for more info. Um, we were talking about Elizabeth Saw, a wonderful one of the many volunteers, <coughs> and you at the last council meeting recognized um, some outgoing uh, volunteers at with Planning Commission. There's been a changing of the guard on some of our commissions and committees. Talk about all those sure, lovely folks out there helping us. I do want to mention a couple of our outgoing um, planning commissioners, long-term planning commissioners. Paul Tetrell um, was on the planning commission from 2004 till 2014. Uh, recently um, stepped down. He served as chair three different times. We also had Jeff Lewis, who was mm -hmm. another long-term planning commissioner from 2006 to 2014, and he served as chair one. So All thank right. you to those two gentlemen. Very time-consuming job, and, and uh, we have... Uh, Two new planning commissioners um, in John Crookshank and, and Bill James. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to them. And thank you to the other 14, or we had a total of 13 applicants, the other 11 applicants. Uh, it's just amazing the level of people willing to step forward and serve. We had very, very qualified candidates. That's good. And um, now with Bill James moving on, is there a vacancy on the finance advisory? There is. Uh, Bill James, and I'm going to thank him for his service, 2006 to 2014 on the finance advisory committee, uh, which we talked about earlier. And Bill is now on the planning commission. Uh, there is a vacancy. And uh, 
I believe April 7th is the cutoff date for anyone interested in serving on the Finance Advisory Committee. Um, so what do they do if they're interested? <clears throat> they, they basically can, con to, if you're interested and want to apply, you can go to the city's website or contact a city clerk and she will direct you. There's an application that okay. you have to fill out and then there are council interviews for, for all the candidates um, to, to come in and, and tell us why they want to serve on the Finance Advisory Committee. All right. But it's a uh, non-paying position, uh, very, very important position. That's actually where you I started the FAC, out. Right? I was. I was on the FAC and then became vice chair of the FAC. And, um, you know, the duties of the FAC are, are prescribed by the council. So they're, you know, we, we take their suggestions into consideration. But there is a specific um, work plan for all of our committees other than the planning commission. So. Right. And a busy time because you're saying we're in the budget process. So there's lots for the FAC members to do and assist with. And I can tell you that the, the, the most recent incarnation of the FAC is outstanding. And the, the data on everything from our uh, pension liabilities to the financing of San Ramon that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. and everything we've given them, they've come back with just, you know, outstanding input and data. We've really got a robust FAC uh, uh, with, you know, ex-banking presidents and, you know, corporate executives and ex-school board presidents. Right. So it's, 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 it's great. A lot, a lot of experience and they say it takes a village. So that's right there. Well, you know, you talk about citizen involvement and that's, this is, that's a very key uh, aspect of citizen involvement are our citizen committees and, and commissions. These are, you know, uh, people that are appointed and not elected, and, and they're the, the voice of the people, as it were. And amazing that it's continued because the city founders, I think, and that was the vision that this is a citizen-led community, and it continues to be that way. It very much is. From, from an official standpoint on the committees and commission, we have one commission now, and, uh, and just our general uh, you know, citizenry that step forward at our meetings and, and tell us uh, what they think. Excellent. Yeah. All right, um, moving on to some headlines, um, probably uh, was, you know, just now at least a few weeks ago, uh, with St. Patrick's Day, we had an earthquake in the L.A. area. Fortunately, no problems reported in our PV, but whenever that happens, mm -hmm. and I'm guilty of it, I think, oh, I don't really have very much water in my garage. Uh -huh. Shame <laughs> um, on you. It brings up that question, how prepared are we in our PV <clears throat> if a big one would ever hit here? And, of course, especially when you think of the water supply, we tend to hear a lot about you know, water supplies would be cut off maybe on the peninsula. Well, there's no question about that. And people need to understand. And, you know, you talk about uh, Katrina and Sandy and you can see, you know, there was, I think, a, a sense of complacency and people were lulled into a sense of security that, you know, uh, government was going to take care of them. And it's clear that that's not going to be the case. And potentially that, that can be the case, that they, you're, you may be on your own for a number of days. And we have an excellent, excellent uh, emergency preparedness committee and on our website, we talk about uh, what the Emergency Preparedness Committee does, how you can prepare, et cetera, specifically about water. The last time I looked, the guideline is um, people need to be prepared to be on their own for 10 days. Now, the city does not maintain a centralized water supply. Everybody, you have to have your own water. And mm -hmm. the guideline is 10 gallons for 10 days per person. So, you know, you can kind of benchmark that. And there's a, the weights and measures are on the website. And it'll give you a guidance not only for you know, food and water and emergency supplies and blankets and electricity and communication. But the city is, is very well prepared. You know, we are, we're part of a regional effort. The county, the sheriff, and the fire department are the primary agencies. You know, the council took this also very seriously. We talked about forming some sort of, uh, some sort of joint powers agency among the four sister cities on the hill. And, and when we really looked into it, the, the regional efforts uh, far outweigh whatever we could do. Um, but we do want to coordinate with our sister cities because we may be an island on our own, right. uh, you know, God forbid, in the, in the case of a major earthquake, as it were. Um, you know, we, but, so what we've done there is the actual emergency committees for the various cities are going to get together and make sure each of us knows what the other's plans are and how we can coordinate. But the city has a disaster preparedness plan. It has supplies, not for every resident, but to mm -hmm. make sure we have some sort of government uh, who's able to assist in, in the case of an emergency. But the big thing is to make sure you have a like, water supply. And I... That's, you know, that's what they stress. You can live weeks without food, but you can live days without water. So if you do anything at a minimum, store that water in your garage. And, you know, the, the bottled water is the best. They say that can last for six to 12 months. Uh, the other thing, I, you know, a little kicker, you might not realize that most people have 40, 50, 60, 70 gallon water heaters, that that water is usable also. It may not be under pressure, but 
don't forget you have that water there too, but mm -hmm. bottled water from Arrowhead works it's real good. easy. Good. I'm not plugging for Arrowhead. Yeah. But <laughs> Any bottled water, even those right. big, big jugs. The big jugs are great that's too, good. but remember too that when you when you use uh, tap water and put it into a, a uh, some sort of container, it doesn't have the same shelf life as something that's been processed and sealed. Okay. So right. something to, something to remember. But go to the website; it has all the information you need. Excellent. Um, moving on to things happening in the city. Uh, on a, on a fun note, uh, there's been a, we've noticed a lot of filmmaking going on here. RPV is popular. Um, place to come in uh, the cities in the last month of March. I think they brought in maybe like almost $20,000 in permit fees or something like that. So A lot of activity in the last couple of months on the filming side. And, and uh, RPV is a hot spot. Trump is, uh, again, I live right across the street from there, and they do an awful lot of filming there. And uh, I get a big kick out of it. My kids and my wife get a big kick out because those, those lights are on, you know. Yep. They, they film through the night. And Terranea is a hot spot these days. And actually... Uh, my understanding is they did some filming at a private residence right. in Portuguese the, Bend recently. The Johnsons, right oh, the across Johnsons. the street okay. from, from me. There you go. They so. were trucks, movie trucks lined up and down uh, Portuguese, you know, when you go into the Portuguese Bend Club inter entrance. Exactly. And, I saw uh, that. Yeah. They were filming Entourage or Entourage. The movie. movie the movie, yeah. That's right. And they had, my wife and uh, kids were disappointed. They didn't know they filmed American Idol down at Terranea and they right. didn't have advance notice of that, which I think was by design. But uh. So, I mean, what do you think of this, that we're becoming an increasingly popular place? I think they mentioned that maybe this month there were different reasons why we saw an increase in activity because, you know, weather was bad elsewhere and shoots were canceled. So they You're exactly right. The, the inclement weather across the country uh, created a, a uh, perfect storm for us to, <laughs> to actually bring these entities in and, and have this filming done in the city. But our city does a great job in, in handling um, film shoots and the applications and ensuring that, that residents aren't inconvenienced. Um, you know, when, when it's shooting on private property, we go through the notification process and what the requirements are. When it's on city property, we actually staff that and have a staff person there 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So um, the permitting process is smooth. I'm, I'm aware of just maybe one complaint over the entire time that, that I, you know, have, have monitored what goes on with respect to filming in the city. Well, it's just a good way to put us on the map. It is. I, I, you know, again, I, I think people get a big kick out of it. You know, the whole movie thing is kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah very, very fun. Yeah. Um, let's look at what the future holds, what's coming up at some of your uh, next city council meetings. Uh, the next one's April 1st, your first and third uh, Tuesdays of the month, by the way. Everyone out there probably knows that by now, but come uh, to check it out. And uh, Absolutely. So what do you get coming on, on board? I think Marymount parking lot expansion for sure. We're going to talk about Marymount. Uh, I think it's at the next meeting, April 1st, the, uh, you know, the issues that were associated with that. And we're waiting to see. I haven't seen it yet. What Marymount's going to come up with some of their own recommendations. Staff came up with what I thought were uh, several good recommendations and mitigation efforts, and, and as did the residents in the San Ramon area and local area there. So. Um, haven't seen what, what Marymount is proposing, and we asked them to move forward with some of these mitigation efforts even before bringing this back to council. So that's, that's a big one because it's a, it's a quality of life issue, and it, it really affects the residents that are immediately surrounding Marymount more so than anyone else in the city. But it's, it's important. Right, and when you mentioned also another Marymount issue, it's been put off to July, which is the um, with the athletic field. And That's right. Like you mentioned, you're working on that one. We're working on a we're working on a on a separate track um, that really doesn't have anything to do with with the uh, request for approval of an athletic field and the the uh, draft uh, mitigated negative deck, as they call it, mitigated negative declaration to the EIR that's already been performed. Um, there were many, many uh, resident comments with respect to the athletic field, and we have an outside consultant addressing all those. Um, we are going the extra effort of explicitly addressing those. When you have an MND, you're not really required to address them specifically, but just if, if they're not deemed to be, uh, um, you know, uh, substantive or substantial, um, you really don't have to address them specifically, but we are addressing each of those concerns specifically. So it's taking a little bit more time, and I think Marymount uh, is welcoming the dialogue also. Oh, good. Yeah. There's always thoughts going on over there. Yep. Um, then we have uh, Malaga Canyon purchased by the city. Um, that was official, and that's coming up on your next um, agenda to decide what to do with the property. That's exactly right. Um, we bought two separate properties, two private pieces of property with 100% grant dollars. Uh, the city didn't expend any money on buying it, and it was, you know, we're, we're coming down to the last few parcels of, of quote-unquote open space, as it were, 
Um, so for the fact that it, we didn't have to come out of pocket for it, uh, we get to preserve another large chunk of primarily canyon space and steep canyon space. Um, and the question is now whether or not that's going to be put into the preserve proper and then turned over to the Land Conservancy or whether or not we're going to keep it uh, as city property. And, and that really has to do with who's going to maintain the trails, the unimproved trails and the signage. But we will ultimately be responsible for fuel modification. We'll probably at some point you're going to see some goats roaming around there. <laughs> Very steep terrain. Um, so, you know, it may cost the, the city, you know, I think it's scheduled, if memory serves, about $12,000 a year. But, you know, I think that's money well spent to preserve that kind of open space and, right. and, and pastoral views. Tremendous. Mally King and moving on, uh, anything else that you want to mention coming up to, to be paying attention to? I know you've got lots going on yourself besides these meetings. You're all over the place. Monthly mayor's meetings coming up for you. You meet with the local mayors. We, we, well, actually, there, we have the, uh, the mayor's breakfast is a meeting that we have with all the heads of the various commissions mm -hmm. and committees. And uh, that's just an outstanding uh, venue to, to exchange ideas. Basically, I give them a quick debrief of the hot topics going on in the city. And then, then the uh, committee or commission chairs come forward or their representative if they can't make it. Um, and they bring forward ideas, and it's just really amazing um, the things that come out of those meetings, the positive ideas and thoughts and, and suggestions uh, in, a, in a very informal setting. Um, so that's your mayor, the one and only mayor at that meeting. Not, that's right. Not the one with, I was thinking of the one when you meet with all the mayors from the community, but that one. So what will be like hot to discuss at the next monthly mayor's meeting for you that you'll be bringing up with department heads? We'll things? talk about all these different topics that, that we talked covered. about mm -hmm. that, are, that are important to the city. But for example, the last meeting, um, I think it was uh, now uh, Planning Commission Chair Leon uh, suggested that we come up with a public works commission because we have such a um, plethora, if you will, of infrastructure issues and public space issues that we may need a formal committee to address and, and focus on these. So I thought that was just an outstanding, absolutely. outstanding suggestion. And I've got some ideas on how they, that may work in with the Water Quality Board, which is mandated by law. But we have a very sharp group of individuals there that deal significantly with, with, with infrastructure issues. And we may be able to maybe bring this Public Works Committee ahead of that. And I may be speaking out of turn. But I am going to bring that forward as a Excellent. future agenda item. Yeah. No, you could see the need, how that would be being formed right now, especially with all like the projects you say coming up and and you can think about all the subcommittees that can be brought forward with respect to Portuguese Bend and storm drains and, and all these things that you know that really need attention and, and, and a form to get this information from the public and to the public. Yep. Well so. keep us posted on that. We'll do. Um, you, what are the things you've been going on? I know you've had, you are at all kinds of events. Yeah, you, you mentioned want... a, that mayor's meeting, and I think I <laughs> mentioned it to you. The, uh, I actually had the occasion to meet with Mayor, L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti, I think it was the 14th, uh, and he has, he holds what, what he calls a regional mayor's meeting, and he's a very, very likable guy and has a, has a big picture of all the mayors and all the cities working together, not so much competing, but working together, and his topics that, that he wanted to discuss at the last meeting, which I did go to, um, were, were uh, regional cooperation with respect to jobs and job creation, which is very important to everybody. Uh, by the way, the, the mayor of Hawthorne, Chris Brown, mentioned, and this is just a public service announcement, there's a company called SpaceX in Hawthorne that's mm -hmm. hiring a thousand people, everywhere from very, very senior engineers to janitorial staff, a thousand people. And he brought this up and said, tell your cities that you're looking for a job, the city of Hawthorne has SpaceX, so anybody We have interested? a lot of engineers here. Engineers, <laughs> support staff, uh, you know, this is cutting edge. These are the people that want to, you know, privately, uh, um, private space endeavors and launching things into space on a private versus, you know, we yep. don't really have NASA anymore, so. Excellent, that is. That was big at the meeting there, and then we talked about, you talked about water, we talked about water conservation, and, you know, the city's doing its part here. We're, we're uh, um, conserving. We're in a drought. We're in a drought, we're in a major drought, and that was the message. And we are, as a city, conserving 20% or cutting back 20% on all outdoor watering, on all city facilities in order to help that. And there were a lot of great suggestions that came forward on how residents individually can, um, can, can assist with the, you know, conserving water in the drought. And there was actually, they talked about programs where actually some cities are actually paying residents to convert their 
uh, landscaping that requires water to drought tolerant plants and, and uh, mm -hmm. less water uh, needy type landscaping. So it's kind of interesting. So that so there were quite a few mayors there. Then I there would think were meeting. there were eighty eight cities in L A County. I think there were about forty mayors at this meeting. So it was it was great to to meet some of uh, uh, our fellow cities and, and wave the RPV flag. And you're probably uh, feeling very good about our, the status of our city. And I very much so <laughs> am. And I actually uh, even had the uh, uh, pleasure of meeting with. I had about a forty five minute meeting after that meeting with uh, Councilman Buscaino of excellent. What I consider a sister city here, even he's though he's practically like a brother, right LA, next door. He's, he's like a brother he's right <laughs> next door. But you know, San Pedro is is right there, and we really don't talk to them as a sister city. But they, you know, they're, they're kind of a uh, They're important. We have border issues too, right? That's a whole other. Lots show, of border issues, and and uh, you know Joe's doing a great job over there, so I appreciate him taking the time unscheduled to meet with me for that time. And all right, well maybe we can bring him into a special city talk, and we'll talk Ooh, about border I think issues. He would we'll like get that. You both on I think board he would here. Enjoy that. Excellent. Um, well, one of the biggest events in our city is coming up: Whale of a Day. Mm -hmm. Always a Whale of a Time, and for the first time in thirty years, that. The Whale of a Day event had to be rescheduled. Um, it's always the first weekend in March, and we were, were sad to see it happen. But the only, one of the upshots is you'll be around, right? Because you couldn't attend. Or you, it's now going to be April 5th. April 5th. Are you 5th. around? <laughs> I will be around Good. April 5th and very much looking forward to it. And my family was very upset, as was I, uh, yeah, that I, 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 I wasn't going to be able to make it. But I do think, and, and the decision not to have it, uh, uh, in March had nothing to do with me. So yeah, I heard uh, that the Dehovic family was doing a rain dance uh, that weekend. <laughs> well, it was. I have to say, it was a it was a very prudent and difficult decision by uh, City Manager Petru. Um, it was a good call. It weather was a great was call because the weather was horrible. It was raining, and and it would have uh, clearly diminished the the turnout to the event. And it is mm -hmm. a really special event. And for those watching that want to come, remember parking is really restricted. That's right. You come up here to City Hall, and they have shuttles down, thanks to the county. Donated by uh, Don Kanabi. Yep. His and so, uh, but it, I mean, I've been going for every, you know year after year, and we come the RPV TVs cruise down there. But it's just such a great community event, and to celebrate the whales that come by, and there'll be lots of them because they're having a busy season. And and my understanding, and as I mentioned to you before we started, that the number of whales has increased, and it's still continuing. There was a concern, you know, everyone you go to whale of a day to maybe see a whale, but the the volume of whales just. Two weeks ago, my wife and I were driving, and she got so giddy in the car, we saw, <laughs> we, we saw a, a, a whale spouting right off the coast, and it's just terrific. That's one of the biggest things. It gives, it gives uh, Whale of a Day gives the ability to recognize what a resource we have and what a, a, a treasure it is to see, you know, the marine wildlife, particularly whales at this point, but everything. You know, you see schools of dolphins, a thousand of them jumping around. We were, we were really, really blessed in, in the ability to see this, and and view them for our particular venue. It's, and and it's right there at PVIC, the Interpretive Center, a jewel, and uh, just to be able to go through that museum, there's just all kinds of things to do there. And like you say, one of the most beautiful spots. It's from 10 to 4. Mm -hmm. um, so that's um, April 5th. We're looking forward to seeing everybody there. And uh, what do you enjoy most about it? I know you'll be there probably, like you say, with your family. You know, we, we, I don't know if you remember, I bring like 10 or 12 kids along <laughs> with me, remember. my two daughters and all their friends. And what I like about it, it's kind of a small town atmosphere. It's really kind of a, a community event. And there's people from, from neighboring cities, obviously, that come out to mm -hmm. experience this. But it really gives you that, that small town feel and it gives you the ability to chat with your neighbors and... Uh, I think the kids just really get a big kick out of it. All the booths and displays and the little giveaways that they get, they just they just love it. And it's a, it's an opportunity to get out there with family and friends and neighbors and, and really mingle and, you know, enjoy one of the, the particular treasures about being an RPV. Right. And a couple thousand people, I think, show up. Since yeah. we're talking a little bit about your family, I'm looking forward to seeing them. Do we have a little message you're supposed to be sending out? Something coming up? Something really special? I do. Thank you for <laughs> reminding me. I just I want to I want to congratulate my wife and her colleagues on the PV Juniors for a very fine event down at Trump uh, two weeks ago, and they raised uh, several hundred thousand dollars for local philanthropies and, and women and, and kids in need. So, congratulations to you, honey, and, and the rest of your uh, uh, sisters, as it were, in the PV Juniors and. Uh, also, my 19th wedding anniversary next week. Uh, uh, so, again, honey, thank you for 19 <laughs> great years, and uh, I love you, and I appreciate everything you do, and your patience with all my council duties. So. Congratulations on that. Very thank special, you. very sweet. We have a sweet thank mayor. You. 
Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I think that's about it. anything else you want to add before we wrap it up here on City Talk. And we've covered a lot. And just I think we covered quite a bit. Uh, you know, again, get on the city website. There's just you know, it's, it's getting better and better uh, every day. And and there's suggestions by council people, council members, and council watchers on how we can improve it. And I have to say that our city staff is very responsive to that. So and it's palaceverdes.com slash rpv to log on. Absolutely. More more information than you uh, you probably want to know. And of course, also all the details about Whale of a Day. Mm -hmm. So thanks again for joining us. We'll have you back in um, in April to update us on the next couple council meetings coming up. And that'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. Here with Mary Dehovic, I'm Liz Brown Swanson. See you next time. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you at Whale of a Day.